We spend a great deal of our time at work, <coughs> various kinds of work. That is the place where soul is made, if soul is present. And that's why I, I'm awfully interested these days in talking to business people about allowing the workplace to be a place of soul, to be an enchanted place, and not disenchanted the way it is, or unenchanted the way it tends to be. And this I'm merely echoing what William Morris said 125 years ago. You know, over and over again William Morris pleaded to people who have factories and places of work to make them places where people can find beauty and pleasure. So yes, I think that the soul is, is to be found and fashioned in our daily work. And I think that in this day, it's difficult to find the, the ordinary life. I, maybe you have it. I don't know. Maybe you have it. Where I live, it's very difficult to find the ordinary life. Everything has to be spectacular. Everything's a special. Everything is special. Everything's celebrity. Everyone's a star, or want to be a star. You know, we have the star. And we can't find the ordinary life. And that's where the workshop of the soul, I think. The ordinary life is the workshop of the soul, where it's made every day. Well, another big influence on me that will not exactly answer your question, but I see it as a corollary, is, uh, is uh, Igor Stravinsky. Very important to me. I love music. I, I was, I'm trained as a classical uh, musician, and I studied composition for many years. So I'm very interested in what Stravinsky has done. He's, he's an absolute ideal for me, a man, magnificent composer, as far as I'm concerned. He reflected on his work, and he said in, his, in his, uh, his Harvard lectures called The Poetics of Music, he says that for him, writing music is a work. And he, the place where, the desk where he writes his notes is his workshop. He said that when he travels, people in the, in the customs, people say, what is your occupation? He says, I'm a laborer. <laughs> you know? This is his view of the creative process, you might say, or the work. I, lo I love that view of Stravinsky. And when I see what he made at his workshop, it amazes me. I don't know if anyone has followed up yet in the same way since then. So yes, this, the, uh, the world is the workshop, certainly. But I, I really recommend, if you haven't read it in a while, to read the letter of Keats about the soul, where he calls the world the uh, veil of soul making, and talks about the school, the world as the school for the soul. I have a, 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 I have a friend who I admire and, and love very much, uh, Houston Smith. I've known him for a number of years, and I don't know if you've heard of him. He's, quite popular in the United States these days because of the television series he did. And he's been teaching about the world's religions for all these years, and I studied with him for, for a couple of years. And his view is that at one point, there's a level at which the religions are all separate and have, have seem contradictory, and then they, there's a sort of cutoff point, then they come together and merge, essentially getting at the same point. He bases this work on some other philosophers especially one by the name of Shua. And uh, I have argued him with him on this for years. I hate that idea. <laughs> I just don't see it. I don't get it. Because it seems to me that the beauty of the world's religions is in their difference. Their differences. Now, where are you when you say they're all saying the same thing? You have, you have leaped out of all particulars. I think you've leaped out of the realm of soul altogether. Soul is, is fairly low and is in diversity, to be found in diversity, it seems to me. That's what's so, so difficult for us. If you notice, people who become very spiritual tend to love bringing everything together. Everything has to be one. Bring everything together. Everybody converge somehow. Let me give you a simplistic story of this. I was, uh, I, I mentioned this also to our group. I was, I was asked to be on this television program one day. <coughs> in the United States, and, <coughs> and I, 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 got, I found myself in a limousine with a, a very a much more successful author than me, a guy whose books are, are sold in the billion, billions, I think, and uh, he and his wife were sitting across from me in this limousine, we just happened to be thrown together, and he said, 
we are going to have a day next year when everyone in the country will meditate at 5 minutes to 12 and we will raise the consciousness of our society by so many degrees on that day. <laughs> I said, he said, would you join us? And I said, I don't think my calendar would allow it. <laughs> um, that is, to me, that is that, that, is that, that very spirit, spiritual place of trying to do it all at once or gather everyone together in one. I'd much rather stay with one family that day and have dinner. You know, I'd rather, I'd rather cultivate the religion of, of the family, the spirituality of that family. My family, preferably. You know? And, I, and, and, uh, and yes, or maybe visit somebody in the hospital that day. You see, my point is that, is that the religions, I think, are, are very distinct, and the diversity is their richness, and there's no need whatsoever to blend them into one. That is an intellectual enterprise that is only there for the momentary satisfaction of the, of the clever mind, as far as I can see. So therefore, what are we left with? We are left with a great deal of diversity. People coming to all sorts of ways of language and rituals of developing a religious attitude in life. And, and I think that that uh, divergency and diversity in the contradictions as well uh, is, uh, is exactly what we need. And you know what is really challenging? Is if you can get to the point where you can say yes to all of those contradictions, you probably are moving into the soul of religion, I would say. If you can say yes to all those contradictions, that takes you out of, out of that place where, where you have to harmonize it all. And it, it blows your mind, literally. You know, it, 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 it prevents you from having a mental experience of all of this. Not an anti-intellectual one, but it, it takes you away from that mental place to the soul and it includes the heart then. This is so difficult because even when, I think, even when people read in various sources, like in Zen teachings and so on, read that you cannot uh, mentally come to uh, this understanding we still try to find a mental, non-mental way of doing it. You know what I mean? We still try to, to see how can, I how, can I, how can I make this a mental category that, you know, that, that betrays logic. Well, the point is not to be mental about it. That's the whole point. Allow your mind to be blown. Get out of that place. Live from the heart more, or from the feet, or someplace, but not, not only the mind, some other place. And then, oddly, strangely, you find that all that diversity makes beautiful sense. And if you try to blend it, you have lost it. That's, that's how I see it. And that, I think, is speaking for soul, diversity. And it's not unrelated to the diversity that is discussed here at Chumarka College in relationship to, the, to nature. It's, it's, all, it's all that appreciation of diversity uh, it's, I think we live, we don't even know how much we live a philosophy of, of trying to make it all one. And when you let that go, you, I think that's when the soul has a chance to emerge. Let diversity exist. Even within yourself. So that within yourself you have a passion for, for me, uh, one of the biggest ones, a passion, I was saying this earlier today, a passion to be at home, a passion to travel. How can I do this? Get a mobile home of some kind? <laughs> live on an airplane? You know, some of these wealthy people put showers in their plane. How do you do that? Well, you do it by, by uh, living fully the contradiction. You, you find this, the solution in the living of it. I, I need to be corrected all the time uh, with my prejudices about this. I don't know what. I give you my prejudices about so, but I where I find it, you can find it. Yes, for me to talk about things that have lost their function, does that mean that things that work well don't have a soul? No, I don't think so. I think a brand new Porsche would be great. I'd like to try that out for my soul. <laughs> <laughs> Never in this lifetime, but <laughs> um, uh, yes. Uh, the ordinary things, and yes, there's no, there's no need to make these things special in any way. I, I agree. I think that 
I think the best, some of the best theologians that I've heard in my time have been the comedians, the stand-up comics. I'd rather listen to them than most lecturers. Well, I will say it, every lecturer. <laughs> because I think there's more soul there. They are doing a great service to us, people who, are com who really have a comic spirit. It's a tremendous gift. Um, yes, and it doesn't have to be, it could be a brand new bicycle, it could be a uh, brand new anything that would be full of soul. Absolutely. But I think we do tend to, in our culture, in loving the new, we tend to neglect what is falling apart. I want to speak for that. That's what I want to speak for. I think that you might find more soul, more insight in, in sometimes, in a television sitcom, than in Shakespeare. Dare I say that? <laughs> <laughs> I take that back. <laughs> Let me think of some other example. <laughs> so I want you all the way there. It, it, it's a good correction to what I am saying. It's very, very good. I need to be corrected all the time because my prejudices come through, and they're only mine. They're my prejudices. And so you, have, you can certainly, as a group, we could find many ways to find soul in the order. Absolutely. 